Welcome to this final installment in our Shucks preview video series. In this video, we're having a look at some card games. These are games where you play cards in your hand onto probably a table. As always, an important thing to remember here is that these are previews, not reviews. There are no opinions at all in these videos, although a couple might sneak through the cracks, but mostly what these are are just little looks at upcoming new releases that we're excited about that will be present at our Shucks convention over in Vancouver. That you better hustle on over if you haven't got a ticket yet, because it's like tomorrow, I think, or today. This is the last video. Take a look at some nice new card games. Hello and welcome to Astra from Mind Clash Play. This is a game of finding constellations in the stars. You gather stardust in your bag to gain inspiration with which you will look at a load of stars in the side and decide, hey, that looks like a dragon. Let's face it, we've all been there, but also looking through this deck, I realised there's quite a lot of constellations that are just like a line of stars. And like just, it's just a line and they're like, oh yeah, well, that's probably a snake. And it's like, I feel like that's cheating, but let's not go into it. Now, in this game, you are collecting these constellations, but they start out available to anyone. This is an efficiency and right game. You're collecting resources and upgrading things so that you can draw on these things. There isn't a flipping or rolling mechanic here, uh, but most of the components you can draw on, which is quite cool. Now, each of these constellations has a starting point and you have to mark that star first, but you can do it on any of the stars around this table and different numbers for different player counts. Now, if you make a line between two stars, that costs you stardust, you can carry on drawing, but you have to carry on without going back. You can't lift up the pen and go to a new one, which means that each time you draw, there's a limited amount that you can go. Now, this is interesting because this creates a puzzle where other people will be the ones who get to finish off the constellations you start. You will probably not have enough stardust to do a whole thing. And most of them are built so that they will take two or three people collaborating to get it. Can you leave a trap so that you know that another player won't be able to finish the thing? And it might come back to you? There's probably more room for that kind of shenanigans at two players, but who knows? Now, whoever fills in the last star is the person that discovers it. They take the constellation, they get the points at the top, and they get to say forever, I found a dragon in the stars, or whatever. A new card will come up, pushing you closer to the end of the game, and the person who discovered it will take the credit for everyone's work, but also get a new bonus that they'll be able to use intermittently throughout the rest of the game. However, you don't get completely done over if you're not the one to finish it. The treats at the bottom of these cards are called boons, and you get one of those, which might be some victory points, or making your bag for your stardust bigger, gaining observation tokens to use to do double observations, which is when you're crossing off the stars that we talked about in the last one. You can make upgrades so that you can have more constellations in front of you, and all of these things will be getting you points as well. You might just be able to get a load more stardust and you can even fit in your bag, which will mean that on your next turn you're going to be able to do special stuff. You can take rest actions to fill up your stardust and this causes the seasons to change and cycle, which means new elements will be able to refresh in your hand. This will also pull stars off the top of the deck, bringing the game ends, represented by this card, some distance down depending on how many players you've got, that tells you the game's over. You've got to stop looking at the stars. Um, and that's it. Yeah, you just write on everything. It's quite clever component use. This is the only, these are the only tokens, really. Mostly you're just going scribbling. Yeah, Astra. All of us are in the gutter, but some of us have got stardust, which means we're discovering stars and scribbling on them with our felt pens. Bye! Matt, welcome to The Great Split. In this game, we're luxury hoarders and we're exchanging goods with each other to try and become the most profitable. It doesn't really make much sense when you think about it. Why would I be a hoarder and I would be exchanging things with other hoarders all the time? Surely being a hoarder means that I want to have all my stuff under one roof.
it depends what kind of stuff you want. Mm. If I was hoarding, for example, rusting bicycles, then I might be up for trading some uh, large multi-packs of beans. Money. Or money. 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 And gems. And statues and books. In this game, we're going to be doing some little card swappy exchangey things. You'll notice that you've got a tiny little wallet over mm. here. And four cards that I just realised I did drop on the floor earlier. Yeah, I did and see forgot them to tell you to pick them up. So maybe just grab, maybe just grab this one. I mean, it's my fault. Maybe just I, grab I a hot saw them on the floor and I thought, <laughs> I ain't picking them up. <laughs> That's where they belong. <laughs> the way this game works, very simple. I will show you what we have in front of us here. We have got our little player boards that have these wonderful little tactile little tracks where we're yeah. going to be popping things up as we get more of them throughout the game. Over there, lovely, lovely, lovely. Partially obscured by mug. Yeah, you've got this big little score track around the edge, doodle, 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 where you're gonna be earning all your points. We've got a big centre board in the middle that's like the sort of round tracker and general admin space. You've got some cards, you've got your little tiny wallet. Got my little uh, envelope. And you also have some delightful little player characters. I don't know if you wanna just leaf through them because they have yes. some really nice little art oh. going on. Ooh, lovely, delightful. sneaky. Lovely. Ooh. Were those some good noises that I made? I like those cards. noises. They're yeah, okay, good. that's good. They're good noises. The way this game works is the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get a card and we're going to add it to our little hand. Mm -hmm. Oh, cards. Then what we're going to do is we're going to create a split. And this will be something that will be good to show on the little camera. Yeah. You'll notice that you have one card that is like a sort of unusual card that's going to slot right into your hand to show the other players how you are going to split your hand in two. So you might put it right slap back in the middle, which means that you're going to do a little two and a two. Mm -hmm. You're then going to take those cards and you're going to put them into your wallet. You're going to go doo doo. And you're then going to pass it politely to the player to your left. You go, there you go, imaginary player three. Here and you go, imaginary Thomas. Ah, whoa. <laughs> so I will receive all of the cards that Matt just gave me and there'll be one in the middle. And I'll choose which of these sets of cards I want to take. I could take two on this side or two on this side. Mm -hmm. I then return the rest of it. I'll put the rest of it back in the wallet and I give it to you. Okay. And then I will then receive my wallet back with the cards that that person didn't choose to make a sort of full hand again. Got if it. If that makes sense. Yes, yes, yes. Those are the cards that you then get to play and you gain resources on the tracks. So you, what you want to do is you want to offer something that's kind of like a little foxy decision. You want to make sure that you're making two even splits so that you get something good back whilst they get something, well, maybe and they don't And trying to entice the other player, I guess, because you can see quite visibly in front of everyone exactly. what everyone has and what they want. Mm -hmm. And what does all of this do? It's all very straightforward. You've got lots of different resources that will give you different things. Books, the more of them you have, the more points you're going to get. Art, throughout the game, art is going to be fluctuating in value. So here, if you have seven art pieces, it would be worth 10 points. Mm -hmm. But if you had 18, it's worth 15 points, if that makes sense. Like on this, this little track is going to be increasing throughout the game. So art's worth different points. That is, that is a, a deeply, I'm going to have to get a close up of that, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's fine. You can get a close up. Blue and green gems are only worth points for the one you have the least of. So you mm -hmm. want to be increasing them at the same time. And gold doesn't do anything on its own, but it lets you boost other tracks by acquiring it. Right. The final piece of the puzzle are these seals <laughs> at the bottom. Basically, you'll notice there are little symbols in the tracks. And mm -hmm. the more of them you have, the more they'll multiply the seals of that kind that you have. I've explained that badly, but you've played a game before. You understand what's going on here. You get a little score multiplier thing. Game goes on for six rounds. The art gradually increases. We have some little intermediary scoring and the cards get more and more valuable as the game goes on. Ooh. Pretty spicy little thing. Juicy gems, juicy busts. That's the great split. Mm. Horrible guild. <laughs> Hi, welcome to a Shucks preview of uh, Keystone North America, presented by me, Ava of Shut Up and Sit Down, and Ted, not officially employed by Shut Up and Sit Down, but clearly wants to get involved. This is just a preview, not a review, just a guide to some of the components and what's in the box and roughly how to play. This is a game about the ecology of North America. It's got a lot of cards of adorable animals, a couple of like very pretty plants and a grid and some tokens and stuff. Everything's quite nicely put together. What you're doing in this game is trying to build a grid full of ecosystems. This is animals that can live together and get on with each other in a functional way. Each of these cards has some icons representing what habitats it can live in, whether it's endangered, whether it likes a particular season or not. It also has a number that indicates I think it's sort of where it is in the food chain, but also just 
what sort of animals it will get on with. The idea is to create what the game calls ecosystems. Now, an ecosystem in this game is any run of cards in a row or column that has a number going consecutively upwards or downwards, like where there is also a matching habitat. So we're looking for animals that live in the same space and can, I guess, eat each other or like survive in positive ways for each other. In particular, there are keystone species like this peregrine falcon. The keystone symbol means that the ecosystem that a card is in will be counted twice. You can get multiple keystones in a thing and you might be able to get a keystone that is in two different ecosystems at once by crossing them over. So there's kind of a little, I don't want to, I always want to say Sudoku, but there's nothing like Sudoku, but there's this puzzle of like, how can I arrange these numbers and habitats so that they add up? Now, on a turn in this game, you're going to be taking one of two actions. The main one is introducing species from the field, which is this row of cards you've got here, and taking them and putting them into your grid. Once you do that, you get to look and see whether there's any matching symbols between neighbouring cards of the card that you've just placed. For each matching pair, you get a synergy token, which is good because that's the money. When you're taking a card from the field, you actually have to put synergy tokens on every card before the one in the row that you want to take. Then at the end of the turn, these slide up, and that means there's synergy tokens on some of the cards for other people to get. So things that aren't wanted by a lot of people will essentially get more and more valuable. We've seen all of this stuff before. The other action that you can take on your turn is using these skill actions. Now these are little bonuses that will give you a one-off treat. They're quite good. They can be ways to dig yourself out of holes. One of them just gets you a load of synergy tokens. So if you've overspent, you can flip this card on your turn and take eight synergy tokens. They will also allow you to do things like place research tokens on animals, which will make their ecosystems be more valuable at the end of the game. One of them lets you move cards and they will let you interfere with the field and remove cards that aren't wanted by people or that you want to avoid other people from getting. This is all nice. So people will take a couple of these actions, but they will actually also be revealing a new exciting option, which is all of the ones that have been flipped over can have their actions, which are worse than ones on the other side but those actions can all be done in one go. So once we're in this state, these three cards could be flipped back over for three whole bonus actions. This does another thing as well, because this actually means that the turn marker token will move one step down, which means that you're one step closer to ending the game. If you can balance all of those pushes and pulls and temptations, and create a good grid with all of the numbers and habitats lined up really nicely, you're gonna do well at the game. Cause, cause that is the game. Add in some secret objectives, which Ted is interested in. A couple of goals to shoot for that nobody else is gonna know about, but still get you a load of points at the end of the game. Potentially, I found them really tricky when I played this. And wild cards where you can place these, they've got different habitats on them, but they can be wild in terms of number and fix the mistakes you've made in placement. Add in those and you've got the structure of the game. Like that's pretty much the whole thing. You've got a couple of different pushes and pulls from the skills in the field. You've got an economy of synergy and you've got this very, very puzzly little, how can I get the numbers and the icons in the right places whilst getting money, whilst getting, research tokens and doing all of the things. It's a lot to think about for a pretty and adorable game. As well as that, there's a solo mode, which comes with one of mine and Quinn's favorite things, as podcast listeners will know, envelopes. There's extra cards in here. I don't know exactly what is in here. I want to know whether I can just put it into my thing, because I probably won't play the solo mode that much, but let's find out what happens. It's not just envelopes for the solo mode though. It's actually a little booklet of assignments, which are all just different scenarios with extra rules, added wrinkles, and added challenge for if you were playing on your own. Presumably, as you work through the campaign in here, you unlock some of these envelopes and get new cards to play with. And that really is Keystone North America. Um, it's got animals and I love their eyes. <laughs> This is Moonrakers, a game that we've talked about before on the Shut Up and Sit Down podcast. Episode number 
here on the screen right now. Yeah. I quite like this game. You do. And they have made some expansions. So today we're not going to be talking about this game, but I'm just going to give you a very light flavour on the throw it away, game. But Don't that's it. Throw no, it. I won't throw it. It's a box. <laughs> So this is a game of trading and negotiation going on missions. You're going to be having your little ship. You're going to be getting some equipment that you're going to be slotting into your ship. You're going to be hiring staff that you're going to be adding to your deck. You're going to be improving your deck, putting things in, taking things out in the hope of them being able to take on these missions more successfully in which you're going to have to be collectively or individually mm -hmm. beating some requirements in terms of like shields. Yep guns you're trying to pull fastness. the right cards from your deck but you can also bring someone else to give you a hand with exactly. that whole process right exactly so gotcha. you can be like i can help with that but then there's always a bit of wiggle room in the fact that some cards let you play a card to draw more cards so you're mm. kind of promising to help on the basis that you <laughs> think you might be able to help anyway that's the base game and today i'm going to go through three of the expansions first expansion what have we got hey it is moonraker Overload. It's got kind of like shiny writing on the box, which makes it very hard to make sure you're actually showing anything uh, on the screen. God bless rotations. Now, what's in this expansion? Well, 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 well. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing because I've put all the cards over there. Oh, uh, and uh, it's just got some little bits. And uh, we'll star wipe now or something to uh, this first expansion being a thing on the table. So the first thing this expansion adds is Overload. These lovely little, uh, slightly milky tokens that effectively allow you to overload things. Usually robots, let's be real. There's new crew available here. You've got a whole new additional deck to add, which has a whole bunch of different things, but mainly, Rob you guessed it, Robips. Yeah. Um, the Robips, basically. Actually, it's not true. There's a whole bunch of things and some Robips. Robips basically uh, have these overload tokens and it means that you add them to the card and after they've finished a contract usually it come back to your hand but instead they're going to sit there with these tokens on so it's kind of a way that you can have cards that then you can keep out of your circulation briefly right. and do different things with there's also other tokens that do things with overload and it's basically something that allows you to do cool big things but then maybe lock cards out of the way for a little while next up That's cute. we've got a whole bunch of like slightly better cards Basically, like all of the normal things you can do, like shield and stuff, you've got like shield plus, energy plus. Ooh, it's slightly better than it was before. <laughs> These are just things you can buy from the shop, like the normal powers, but they're just better versions of those they're things. They're overloaded versions. Yeah, I guess they, I guess they are. I'm sensing a theme. Yeah, and then also, you know, you've got like new ship equipment, which often actually works with this new overload system in terms of like having stuff that adds overload tokens to things or having new kind of bits of equipment that let you trade up some of the normal cards for some of the more advanced ones. Finally, you've got some new objectives that use some of that stuff. I particularly like this one on the top. Parasite. It's just like, oh. completes contract without playing any cards. <laughs> Very <laughs> unpleasant. And last but not least, I do like this. You've got some more of these little like kind of contract cards, the cards that are like the bread and butter of the game in terms of doing jobs. You've got head-to-head -head contracts, which basically mean that you're going to be competing to try and do the best right these head-to-head -head objectives basically as many people can go along and i believe you can just choose to participate so you don't have to be invited you can be like yeah i'm gonna come and then if you win then you get prizes if you come second you get prizes third you get nothing finally we've got these other ones that allow you to do any type of thing so this one requires energy and anything oh. and these are oh. <laughs> there's some like rainbow stuff on these cards and i've got a lot of time for that the production quality in this game is already yeah. ridiculous it's kind of absurd they've added rainbows Next expansion. Next up, get excited for fans of neckwear. It's Binding Tides. Now, this is an expansion that basically kind of spices up or encourages you to mm -hmm. do a bit more collaboration with people. Um, although, if you are already kind of terrified by the table space, then hey, it's getting worse. It's getting bigger. Uh, it's getting bigger. It's getting bigger. The third one, I promise, doesn't make it bigger. It just changes things. So you're going to be adding on this reputation terminal that's just going to be slotting gently onto the top of my board here. Just ignore the chaos I'm causing in the process of this. <laughs> Three expansions, it's going to happen. With this reputation terminal, you have these snazzy little reputation tokens that basically you're going to put tokens onto your board of every color other than your own. So really, it just means that like this is representing your relationships with the other players playing right. the five-player game. We have those colors. And then really, it just means that every time you work with someone else, 
you're going to get some reputation. Mm -hmm. You're just going to nudge it along with them. So it's like, hey, we could do something together. We did. Anyone who was there, we're going to nudge those colors along. Very nice, very neat. And then there's some new cards as well that basically are ship parts and objectives that let you do things involving reputation, gaining reputation. And then what do you do with reputation? Prizes. Basically, the way it works is it means that you've got these two different types of ways you can cash it in. You've got one that requires you have up to that level of the same type. So you'd have to be like level four with one type of thing. Uh... And then you can use that or the any, which means you can basically just be like, have a total of five You can reputation. mix and match. You can mix and match and you can spend that reputation at any point. Mm. Well, at any point that does the thing that, you know, rules of games, etc. So that's a nice, <laughs> nice little thing, you know? Yeah, that's nice because it means that you can either spread bet with a bunch of people. And I mean, you're always rewarded for collaboration, which yeah. is kind of what it the game's is, about, you know, if you're not, if people aren't collaborating, it's just a spicy thing to make people want to do it more often. That is that mini expansion. Time to pop on to the last one. Third up on the frankly comedy mess zone at this point. Ah! <laughs> it is uh, Moonraker's Nomad. I'm nomad about more expansion for Moonrakers. Let oh, me yes. Tell you, so, buddy. This basically is something that replaces things on the board. How oh, are no. we going to do this neatly during the video? We're not. We're not. It's going on top. So, well done. Yes. This board replaces this, this board. board. Which is good because, oh no, it is on camera. It is on camera, just. I had to zoom it out a bit. Goodbye, that board. We now have planets instead. So basically the way this works is we have that board. We also have then an additional other prestige tracker, which was on the other board and is now gone. Therefore, we need it. And this prestige tracker flips around to be up to 15 points for people who just don't want to stop playing. <laughs> don't want to stop. I want to make a day of it. And to be fair, like there's elements in this which do make it a bit more of a kind of make a day of it kind of game. Big juicy. Big and juicy. So I'm going to whack that there over the stuff quite unceremoniously. The way this works is you get this stuff and you also get some additional more ships. So these little ships here that would be on the prestige track, you also have ships that go here on this map. And it's out of my reach. It's quite far away. Do you want me to do some hands? Do some great hands. Just do whatever hands you feel comfortable with. So effectively the way this works is you're going to have contracts that are going to be popping up but whether or not you can do those contracts is dependent on where you are. In space. Which means you can only do a contract if you are in an adjacent system. Right. Uh, so you can have four different places, four different types of contract that all kind of lean towards different types of things. So mm -hmm. the green ones will be more shieldy, gunny, da -da -da. so it means you can kind of choose where to go in terms of like what you specialize in. Yeah. But the people who can come along is completely dictated by geography. Excitingly, <laughs> you also have a special place up here right which is like another secret area it's not here because i'm not there's too many things there's these one of these cards is a little secret purple planet i'm gonna find it yeah find the purple planet the purple planet effectively once somebody takes it on as a mission i think that might be it i think it is anomaly detector we found it whoop, 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 whoop. Let's close up camera have fun with my anomalies basically the way this works is you have an anomaly you do the anomaly and then, oh boy, that's, that's kind of normally, and you flip it over and then you've got a whole new space you can go to. And Cerulea basically replaces the anomaly on the board. And it's a fifth location that you can go oh. to. And it's connected to all the other ones. Counts as everything. And doing stuff there gets you special equipment. These, these oh, special the prototype prototypes. equipment. So it's like a kind of like a secret planet area where you can get some prototype cool weaponry. And yeah, so you've got some like, Space travely bits, some more cooperation y bits, or just a big whack of cards that adds new things and robots. Everything does seem batteries. to just add more card. It's it's a lot of stuff. Some yeah. lovely little boxes. And we've made a real mess we've of it made on this a real table. Mess. But that is the Moonraker trio of expansions. Nice one. Hi, welcome to this Shucks preview of Canopy, a game by Weird City Games and designed by uh, Tim Eisner with art by Vincent Dutre. Now, Canopy is a game of ecosystems. You will be building trees out of these cards here. You will also be populating the forest with seeds and disease and plants and maybe even some animals. I don't think you're supposed to be farming disease, but you know, that was the card that I drew. I should probably stack these decks more. Now, one of the things that is going on here is that these trees 
can stack with each other. But there's also these top cards which multiply the points that the trunks have been worth. However, because there's ones that multiply by zero and things that are worth zero, uh, and you have to plant something as soon as you get it, you don't always want all of these things. We also had diseases and fires that could be wrecking your forest as well. So there's cards in this deck you don't want. Why is that interesting? Well, because you are going to have to take all of the plants you can get, and it turns this drafting system we've got in the middle here into a little push-your-luck puzzle of uh, tree panic. Tree panic's not a thing. Um, I don't know. I, I would panic in a tree. I'm not going to go into the details of how the trees and the animals and everything scores because you've kind of seen a lot of this stuff already. Some things combo with other things, some things like to be in certain places, some things you want lots of, some things you want little of, some things you want to have very specific amounts of. And we've got that thing of getting forced to take cards you might not want. How does that work? Well, the drafting in this game works by looking first on your turn at the new growth one pile. You take a look, there's just one card in there at the moment. In this case, it's a toucan. Do I want that card? I mean, it's not a bad card. I could say yes, could say no. I'm going to say no because I'm explaining the game. What will happen then is an extra card will be added to that one without me looking at it. And then I get to look at the next pile. Now, I can't go back to that first pile ever again. I'm stuck with a later pile in the thing here. Oh, and you see here, perfect example, New Growth 2 has given me a token and a disease. That's explicitly worse than what was in New Growth 1, right? It's bad. Now, the disease will only actually be a problem for me if I get two of them, so maybe I can, but maybe I want to take a look in the third pile here. Now, this already had three cards in it. Remember, we add another card to the season we've just said no to. Then we look at the three cards and we find out, oh, this is great. There's loads of wildlife here. I'm just going to take this and settle for it. Now, if I had said no to three, I would put another card on it and I would draw a card from the top of the deck. Could be good, could be bad. It's not going to be as many cards as the other ones, but maybe that's less risk. You then put a card in the place where you've just removed them from and pass over to your other player who will make the same set of choices starting in the first pile here. Note though, that pile is bigger, it's different. I don't know what's in it. It was a token, now it could be a token and another token, or it could be a token and a disease, or a token and a fire, or a token and a treetop. The game is broken up into three seasons with scoring happening at the end of each of these, but most of your cards sticking around for both of them. You'll get points for having the tallest finished trees. You'll also get points for your trees only at the end of the season and you mark them with one of these adorable animal tokens. These season cards add a bit of variability in an optional game mode or wrinkle up your solo play if you want. Overall, it's just cute animals, plants, ecosystem thinking, and I quite like that they had paper envelopes for everything, so there's not any plastic in there. So that's Canopy from Weird City Games. Uh, go and take a look at it, if you like the sound of it. Welcome back to the Midnight Sun, baby. What? The Midnight, <laughs> the midnight Sun? Yeah, it's called Midnight Sun. Oh, OK, well, that's the thing then. It's the first booster pack. Is it called a booster pack? No, it's not called a booster pack. That was a different thing. It's the first pack in the Borealis cycle oh. of Project Nisei, which is the fan run continuation of Netrunner. Mm -hmm. However, I just called them Project Nisei. That's not true. They're, They're not called that anymore. They've changed their name. They've done a little swapsy. They're now called Null Signal Games, which is good because, you know, their logo it's is just easier. a big N. Yeah. So, you know, it's a good swap. Nice. Yeah, they they managed it. Previously known as. So this is the first kind of addition to the base version of the rehashed thing by fans of Netrunner. No. This is actually their, I think, second or third expansion to the game. This one is improving on a lot of the things that, um, well, that we, we gave feedback on, I guess, in the video. Um, we've got all original art this time. None of the AI-generated fancy stuff. It's all human art, mm -hmm. and it looks good. Mm -hmm. It's it got some spicy nice. theme. It's got a whole load of new mechanics. Let me tell you about what's going on in this booster pack. I keep calling it a booster pack. It's just an expansion. Boosty pack. 
Can we I have... just start moving the cards around? You can start moving the cards around, get us some nice I feel roll. like I'm going to lean into my ignorance. Yeah. Uh, and just be like a child uh, playing <laughs> an arcade machine without money. Yeah, that's fun. I feel like both myself and Quinns were like, we're getting into Netrun. And you were like, cool, can I have a go? We were like, no. <laughs> no, you did the same thing that Quinns did of being like, <laughs> yeah. And then, and then almost a week later was like, no, I'm in too deep now. You can't come and I swim with me. Back. I swim with sharks now. And I'm there with my armbands being like, okay. <laughs> Um, so what I won't do is I'm not going to talk about a load of like specific cards in this so that I'm not to alienate people who aren't into Netrunner. I'll just talk about what this pack adds. What does it do? Generally. Okay. So we've got some new keywords for all of these different factions. We've got three new runners, three new IDs for each of the main factions. And they all sort of come with a new mechanic, which I won't go into detail about. I'll just give a rough idea. There's a new mechanic called marking, which is basically you shuffle these three cards mm -hmm. and you're now sort of extra good at running against that kind of server on your turn. So you might be better at attacking their hand or better at attacking their bin or better at attacking their deck. Gotcha. That's the new mechanic for criminal runners. For anarchs, we have sabotage. Sabotage is when you sabotage things, right? Yeah, you just tear it up. You just smash into their HQ. But you break things. You smash you break things in their like bin. on purpose. Yeah, yeah. That just seems that seems quite illegal, seems doesn't it? Really? Naughty at the yeah. very best. Well, let's talk about a nice simple one, which is charging, which is what these people do. They just make their cards a little bit better. Seems quite boring, really. The other two are really exciting. Yeah, but this deck also has some diving people on it. Yeah. And diving people seem like good people. I absolutely adore the art for deep dive. Look at this. It's mm. beautiful. Exactly. They're going the down there looking for some cool stuff in the ocean. Mm. Uh, a lot of this pack is kind of themed around like deep sea mining extraction is what's happening for the corporations and the runners are sort of roughly themed around being like, no, that's a bad idea. Don't do that anymore. And that's kind of like the rough outline of the story so to show that we've got this nice little dynamic between but there's so much good stuff in this water <laughs> that we can have i know it was just ripe for the taking we've got like this um sort of like nice little intrepid explorer uh, who's one of the new runner ids and then that clashes with uh with this horrible new corporation which is just big boat as you can see here. Is, what is it called? A super tanker? Something like that. Super, super heavy logistics. <laughs> okay, right. Super heavy logistics. Please get your hands off my super heavy logistics. <laughs> so we've got three new runner IDs, two new corporation IDs, a whole bunch of new cards to expand your deck building options. And as always, because Nisei is a non-profit fan collective that is just doing this because they love the game. You can do I a print and play. I called them Nisei again. Null signal games. Signal. You can do a print and play? You can do a print and play. Hey, I got something right. Bah, bah, bah. Print out all the cards that you want, or you can buy them in a little box. Depends like how fast your printer is. My Inkjet 3720 is remarkably Ooh. slow. Oh, I thought you were going to say remarkably fast. No, no, we'd be here for like a year. For oh. this, I think. That's, that's a, a good amount of time. It's worth the wait. And at, by that point, all of these underwater cards would have all dried up and got salty. Huh. Yeah, the environment. Welcome to Wormwood, population, future. I thought you were going to say population. Worms! Population worms. <laughs> Worm City. This is a game that has a lot of similarities, to my eyes, to Netrunner. However, mm. my eyes ain't so good at that, so we'll have to see what Tom thinks. <laughs> but there's certainly uh, some fun stuff going on with this. This is a game where you have some pre-made decks here that are all different kinds of groups in this futuristic, dystopian future. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to be taking one of these decks of 30 cards and adding to it 30, no, 20 echoes. Now these Ooh. echoes are basically are things that you need to score or steal and score throughout the game. Right. And these are cards that just sort of go into your deck, get shuffled in, and then they're going to appear throughout as we go. I see. As we play, you're going to have your deck here in the middle of your little zone. To the right of it, you can have your citadel from which you're going to be using resources to forge cards. Ooh. And over here, you're going to have like your card that represents your faction, that's uh -huh. kind of like your leader, has some special powers on it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then to the other side of that, you're going to be building facilities. So from your hand of cards, yep, get myself some cards, just a little, a little treat. I've got a lot of worms. You've got a lot of worms, it's crazy. You're putting the worms into worm wood. Uh, as you go along, you're going to be basically playing stuff mostly to the forge that allows right. you to then start building it but sometimes you're going to have reaction based cards that are just like whoosh, boom, boom, and gotcha. does a thing understood what sort of things are you going to be forging well you're going to be forging facilities as i say that will do things on an ongoing basis and units okay now your units when you've made them are going to be either going in one of two lanes either in front of your citadel or in front of your character which basically represents your hand of cards i see and then the way it works 
is that by doing this, you're going to be effectively trying to protect attacks upon either your forge, which I'll get to in a second, or your hand. Okay, and then this is the point where I was like, oh, that sounds a bit familiar mm -hmm. to me, in a nice little. way, of the fact that if you manage to make a successful attack and break through that lane, mm -hmm. then you can then look at cards from the other player's hand. Oh, and steal out of echoes? And if they have echoes, then you take them and score them. Gotcha. So there's kind of like, you know, a bit less asymmetry, but in a way that's, you can either be trying to find echoes over here or echoes in their hand. Gotcha. The forging thing, I think is quite neat. Effectively, what you're gonna do is you're gonna place a card face down on this table and you're gonna spend one of your citizens, which are just gonna be sitting on here on your citadel and you're gonna get them each turn as a kind of income. You're gonna spend a citizen and put it on the sort of first slot oh. of that card. And then it means at the sort of start of the upkeep area of every round, you're going to be able to move all your citizens along by one space gotcha. until you have paid for a card. And once right. you've matched the value of that card, you can then take it up into your hand. And that's true also of echoes. And the fact mm. that echoes basically you are things that you're going to be placing down, putting a token on, and then effectively trying to get them so that next round, they only cost two, they all only cost two, but you can't score them in the same round you put them down, which means next round, mm -hmm. Someone's gonna be able to score it straight away because gotcha. it will already be on two by next time. So whenever anyone puts anything into their forge, they could be scoring a point if you don't go to the uh. forge and have a look at it. Have a little peek. However, you are just gonna be putting stuff on and trying to activate more powerful cards later on. Or yep. maybe bluffing and going higher than one or two to make people think that it's not a echo when it is. Gotcha. Where you can kind of, yeah, do a little bit of bluffing, do a little bit of tricking. And it's then exciting. the other part of it is the fact that once you've spent these things to create things, these citizens kind of become like lower class of citizens, become workers. Oh, uh, and then that you, sounds like real life. And then you use them as health on the characters. <gasps> that so also sounds like real life. So actually you can see the health bars on this one. This one apparently I think needs an actual kind of like uh, high class citizen. But right. with most things like your spore warriors here, for example. Uh, I we think you'll find be, their spore weevils. I, I'm, huge apologies to Mr. and Mrs. Weevils. Uh, you can have up to four health based on old units over there that then has to be broken through in order to like mm. kind of count, count as the, the attack value. I see. So yeah, quite a, a neat little interesting thing. Yep. Uh, using the back of cards in an interesting Yeah, I was gonna say they're very striking card backs and they're also functional. Mm. That's Wormwood. That is Wormwood. Cool.